Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to Shackleton and the Rising Tide, Climate Change in Antarctica. Um, the, today's event is co-sponsored by the Hopkins Center, and I'm Stephanie Pacheco. I'm the manager of outreach and arts education programs at the HOP. And we are so grateful that the IGART Dialogues in Polar Science and Society Seminar Series and the Institute of Arctic Studies here at Dartmouth has joined us as a co-sponsor for this event today, but also really as a partner throughout many of the residency activities um, with Phantom Limb here on campus. And Phantom Limb first uh, came to Dartmouth in 2009 when they performed the fortune teller at the hop. And since then, we have invited them back for two developmental residencies with their current production, 69 Degrees South, which um, really in very beautiful imagery tells the story of Sir Ernest Shackleton's 1914 to 16 expedition to Antarctica. And they found that really Dartmouth was a good home for the development of this piece because with the support of the Arctic Studies Institute, with some resources we have at the Special Collections Library here at the college, including a diary from an expedition member, um, and with other local resources such as um, Krell, um, there really was this wealth of resources. And so we wanted to invite our partners to the table today to have a little bit of a discussion about the issue of climate change and how it's approached both by the artists, Eric Sanko and Jessica Grinstaff, as well as scientists and, and academics working here at the college. Um, we've, we've passed out a bio sheet, so I don't want to belabor the, the reading of bios, but you'll see that we definitely have some some very accomplished folks here. Um, New York City-based Phantom Limb Company was founded by Jessica and Eric in 2007. And they really delve into contemporary issues um, and modern life using marionettes and all sorts of various media, which you'll hear them discuss a little more. Um, they are both very accomplished artists in their own right. Uh, Eric is a 16-year veteran of the Lounge Lizards, and he also um, heads up his own band, Skeleton Key. And Jessica Grinstaff is an installation artist and a painter, and her work has been seen everywhere from Mass Mocha to Melbourne. Um, Ross Virginia is the Myers Family Professor of Environmental Science the director of the Institute of Arctic Studies here at the Dickey Center, and he also directs the National Science Foundation's IGERT program in polar environmental change. And Meredith Kelly is an assistant professor of earth sciences here, and her research centers on terrestrial records of climate change, including geological studies of glaciers and ice sheets. So you'll hear from them. Um, now I'm very pleased to introduce Jay Satterfield, who's the head of Dartmouth's Rauner Special Collections Library, and he will be our moderator today. Um, arriving at Dartmouth, he said that he found he had become a curator of one of the deepest polar collections in the world, and he's trying to not be an expert, but says that in about another 40 years he might get there. So without further ado, thank you very much, and Jay. I try to cope with uh, New Hampshire winters by uh, reading about an Arctic or an Antarctic expedition each year, and it makes it seem so warm in my house <laughs> and so well fed as well. So, um, but uh, yeah, as, as I'm, I'm catching up in this field, it's, uh, it was, it was uh, um, not something I'd ever studied before, before coming here, and then discovered we had one of the best collections in the world, and, um, um, and so I'm particularly excited about, about what's going on right now, this idea that, that something from that collection, um, which we've used a lot to inspire students and classes and, and, and uh, researchers from around the world, is, is now having a different kind of inspiration that it's, that's creating a work of art um, that I think talks to the collection in interesting ways and talks to the science in different ways. And that's really what the panel is here for today. What we have here is a nice nexus of of the arts and the sciences um, coming together very naturally on a, on a topic that is very pertinent today. And um, what we'd like to do is spend uh, some time with each of the panelists speaking about their own research and their own work and how that um, relates to climate change, how it relates to the Antarctic. And um, then we'll have a discussion um, sort of amongst 
the panel about where the where the, the the things overlap and where they where they speak to each other and and then how they can possibly speak out to a broader audience as well um, and then after that we'll open up the floor for questions so we should have a, a rousing good discussion on this I think um, before we get started with the the um, well it's not really it, we're going to start with there we go it's not before we get started because we're started um, we're going to start with Ross um, talking a little bit, just giving people a brief history of Shackleton's um, journey so that we sort of all have a shared understanding of, of the events that occurred that we'll be talking about for the rest of the time. So, Ross. Well, thank you very much. It's it's really a great opportunity for me to be here, and um, I want to thank uh, everyone involved in 69 South and our, our creative artists here for having a chance to look at science and look at a place that I think most of us are fascinated by, not heard about, have, most of us have not been there, um, but Antarctica and, and what draws people to this space and this place and why is it important to the future of the planet to understand Antarctica both as a place uh, but also as a place controlling the Earth's climate system. So. Um, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about Shackleton and the Shackleton story, just to kind of get us onto uh, the same page. And to do this uh, as it should be done, take days to talk about this amazing person and his exploits and the whole history of the heroic age of polar exploration. And so if you get hooked by any of this, um, I'm happy to talk to you about what you might want to read. You should definitely get in touch with Jay Satterfield. We have the best collection in the world of material on this type of exploration. Okay, so um, this was kind of pulled together uh, fairly quickly, but a little context here. I'm going to be talking about Antarctica, right? It, it's the big white continent, looks like a pork shop, right? I'm going to be talking about a few places. This is a good way to think about it. Um, I'm going to talk about um, Shackleton and where he went, but Meredith and I work in a different place in Antarctica, and we hope to be able to connect what we do to, to Shackleton. So um, I'm going to be talking about Ross Island in the place called the Dry Valleys, and you'll see what, why they're important in a minute. Um, this little star here, this is where the Endurance sank. This is where Sha Shackleton's ship on the Trans-Antarctic Expedition went under and so starts his great voyage and uh, trying to find a way home to save his crew, and I'll fill that in in a moment. And I'll be talking about Elephant Island, which is where many of his crew spent quite a few months waiting rescue um, Shackleton leaving Alphen Island, going to South Georgia um, for, for help. Okay, well, Shackleton, how did he, how did he get here? What, how did he start? Well, he actually started with Robert Falcon Scott on Scott's first expedition trying to reach the South Pole in 1903. And um, this was the first attempt at the pole. They didn't get very far, but Shackleton and Scott and another man, they got farther south than anyone else. Um, they had to come back, Such en that ended that expedition. There was a falling out between Scott and Shackleton. Shackleton decided that he was going to return with his own expedition and reach the pole. So he organized that expedition. This is a picture from that in 1907 to 1909. This is Shackleton's first expedition as leader, called the Nimrod expedition after the ship. He and two others, um, Marshall and Wild, got within 100 miles of the South Pole. Remarkable feat, the three of them. Um, they could have made it to the Pole, but Shackleton realized that if they got to the Pole, they would starve to death on the return. And you, you can imagine the decision, how hard it was to, to turn around. You can imagine their mental state facing this challenge and doing the math. And this is what they set out to do, and they're so close, just a few days march. But he turned around and came back. And this begins the legend of Shackleton as the leader, you know, the strong leader, the, the, the person that if there was ever an expedition, you wanted to be with Shackleton. That was the, the folklore that began to develop there. He's, you know, he got back with his people. Um, um, starting, supporting that expedition, um, the Nimrod expedition was this hut, which is on Ross Island um, near McMurdo Station in the Dry Valleys. The hut's now being restored. This is a picture I took a few years ago. This is near where I do my work. And I've had the, the amazing opportunity to be in this hut a number of times and to just sort of feel the aura of, of these explorers and the people that 
that, that we all wonder about and admire and, and can't imagine how they were able to persevere in the environments that they were in. But this is Shackleton's hut. Um, and it's a living museum. They, they walked out of there with all their gear and food and other things in there, and much of it still exists. And I think for a good number of people in this room, it's the story and the huts and these places that, that focuses attention on Antarctica. And this is one way we think about Antarctica as this place of discovery and history. Um, so Shackleton didn't get to the South Pole. He came back. Scott, Amundsen, they return. They get to the South Pole. Shackleton no longer has the big prize in front of him. So he has, what's he going to do? He's got to go bold. You know, what can I do? Like, I can't be first to the South Pole. I can be the first to walk all the way across the continent. All right. So this lays uh, the plans for the Trans-Antarctic Expedition. And the, the plan was, was to uh, sail down from South America to the place that looks, the peninsula which juts up, remember the pork chop? And um, it might be worth actually going back, I'm sorry. Okay. To um, sail down from South America, and they were going to land here, march to the South Pole, and then march all the way to Ross Island. Okay, that was the plan. Well, they got to here, they got frozen into the ice one day from reaching the continent, trapped in the ice. The ship drifted, it drifted, it was eventually crushed by the ice by the ice. Here's the endurance listing um, in its final days. Um, Shackleton knew that, that th their only hope for survival was to move off the ship, set up camp on the ice. And remember, the ice, the ice is drifting. It's rotating. So they're changing position every day as they move across the, 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 the ocean there. And they were hoping that they would drift towards, towards land. And when the ice would break up, they would jump in three small lifeboats that they had and everything would just be great, okay? Um, turned out to be a lot more complicated than that, of course. Um, they, uh, they were able to survive on the pack ice. There are all kinds of great stories and adventures there. Um, they eventually were released into the ocean in three boats, um, three very small boats and lots of men, like almost 30 people. Um, they were able to sail to Elephant Island. Um, hallelujah, they got to Elephant Island. One problem. There are no people on Elephant Island. It's way out of the way. There are no ships that ever go there. Remember, there's no radio. There's no, you know, there's no Blackberries. They can't communicate with anyone where they are. You know, no one's going to miss them for another year, right? So that's really hard to deal with that. So um, Shackleton decided that they needed to find a way to another place where the crew be, could be rescued. So he left most of his crew behind on Elephant Island to survive on their own. And then he sailed off in a very small boat, the James Caird, with uh, 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 four others, three others. Am I doing the math right? There's people who correct me here. 900 miles and through the open ocean and the most amazing boat journey ever. They got to South Georgia Island and he eventually returned and saved his crew. Okay, so that's that's sort of the story. So the, the endurance is the ship, right? Um, the main players um, relevant. To today, here's Ernest Shackleton. I'm going to talk for a minute about Thomas Ord Lees. This is the crewman. This is the diary that the Special Collections holds, written by him. Um, he was one of the people left behind on Elephant Island. Um, and then this is Worsley, who was the captain of the Endurance and was very, he sailed with uh, Shackleton to um, South Georgia Island and wrote about that piece of the journey. So, um, this is the group of people left behind on um, Elephant Island. Um, you can see how dark their clothing and their faces and their skin are. They're coated with, with seal blubber, oil, smoke. Um, they turned their boats over on top, uh, made shelters from their boats, and lived underneath their boats for many, many months. Okay? The Endurance sank on November 21, 1915, and Shackleton got back to the crew on August 30th, 1915. Okay, so that gives you a sense of how long this, this survival story is about. You can see um, Ord Lee's here. He was in charge of the motorized sledges and the ship's stores. Um, he was probably the least liked person on the expedition. <laughs> it's, it's very curious to read his diary when you learn that about him. Um, but he also had some very special traits and he was one of the strongest admirers of Shackleton. 
He wrote glowingly of Shackleton and his leadership in his, in his diary. Here's the diary. It's over in Rahner. Um, you can go over and look at this, hold this, read this. Just find Jay and, and the staff there, and they'll help you with that. Um, here's some pages from this diary. To think that he could, he could focus on what was happening day by day in, in this very legible writing, um, record all kinds of different events, his moods, what was happening, what was happening around him. Um, it's a little hard to see here, but here's a sketch. The ship is trapped in the ice, and it's already leaning. And um, the boat's listing at almost 30 degrees. And you can see this person's propped up against the wall, and it's kind of walking across the ship like this. Um, here's per perhaps the, the start of the most famous part of the expedition, the boat journey, part six. It's part six of his diary. And he goes on the, to uh, describe the start of the boat journey. Um, now they're at Elephant Island. Here's a sketch of Elephant Island, the various features in the glaciers and the beaches. They survived by killing penguins and elephant seals. And they had a very small amount of stores that they were able to bring with them on the ship. And so much of the diary, particularly near the end, talks about food, <laughs> dreaming about every kind of food that they might have. Um, and then also bartering food and trading food and the whole little culture that happens in isolation. Um, if you if you're interested in a diary and a bit more, there's a tied to the 69 South uh, uh, performance is an exhibition. It's up in the Baker Library right now. Um, Dennis Grady was uh, uh, the illustrator for this and, and the creative force behind that. And I worked with him. And we identified certain sections from the diary that we thought were really interesting to read. Um, so this is, this is a, sort of an inspiration and a centerpiece, I think for all of us in thinking about Antarctica and this, this performance piece as well. Um, uh, if, if I could have like 60 more seconds, I want to read the last three uh, uh, short blurbs that I pulled out of the diary that kind of showed the roller coaster that these men were on. Now remember, November 21, 1915, the ship goes down. Here's the entry from August 20th, 1916. Okay, so they've been out there a long time surviving together. The meat heap is dwindling down. We have practically no penguin steaks left. <laughs> so are having boiled legs daily for breakfast. Two legs each, boiled penguin legs for breakfast. And the partly putrid seal meat for hoosh at night. OK, so three days later, all right, we made a fine snowman with stones for buttons. And Marson made a really lovely snow lady of the, of the well favored by nature type, hardly suitably attired for this climate. All right, so they're going from starvation to building snowmen to keep themselves occupied and keep their spirits and their moods up. Just three days later, Marston had gone up Penguin Hill to make some thumbnail sketches, as he is wont, and Hurley had joined him. We heard from the former pattering and panting along up the path to the sty, this place that they were going to. Wild, there's a ship, he said excitedly. Shall we light a fire? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, <laughs> excitement was intense as the little vessel rapidly approached, and she hoisted the Chilean naval flag. We broke into enthusiastic, but nonetheless feeble cheers. The description is they were so weak, they weren't even able to really yell at this point. For the nightmare of nightmares was over at last. So it's quite a story. I encourage you to read some of the rest. And um, I'll stop now. Hopefully, that's enough background. It's probably too much, but I just love this stuff. I can't stop. So I'm moving <laughs> away from the mic. So I'll turn it back over to Jay now. Okay. Uh, Eric and Jessica are going to talk about their project and, and how the diary inspired it and where, where the new life it took on. Thanks, Russ. Well, you just did a lot of our work for us, so thanks for that. That was very beautiful. Um, thanks for coming and for having us here. Um, I love that you isolated that as the, as the, the, the those are the passages that you read from the... Um, from the diary. Thank you. From the diary, because it's something we talk a lot to our cast about when we're talking about why we love the story so much. Um, the, the context for this, the snowman entry is that Shackleton, when he left them on Elephant Island, said that he would be back in, in one month maximum. And that entry about um, building a snowman together was written after four months. So you can imagine 
the, I mean, could you imagine the state that they may have been in in terms of hope? And yet they're still playing together. And I think that's part of what we find so beautiful about the story. And, and this is a day or two before they were rescued. So, you know, probably rock bottom, if you will. And um, I, we love that passage too, it's really moving. So, how should we start? Um, we came to this story of Shackleton actually through a, a staging concept that Eric was interested in, which you can talk a yeah. bit about. Well, uh, Jesse and I were working on another play, and uh, through fooling around with ideas, we came up with the idea of putting marionette operators on stilts. We do marionette designs and uh, sets for other people as well. And um, we had been thinking of this design always in a big field of white with the dirty little puppets underneath the puppeteers. And Jessica had been thinking of uh, having a, a ship in the next set that we did. So we thought, where do you see a lot of white and a ship? <laughs> and we thought of this, these uh, iconic Frank Hurley pictures. And we both knew vaguely about the story. And we started delving into it more and more and more and got completely enraptured. Yeah, so we made a research residency on our, I think it was our five year anniversary. We took two days off and rented a house and stack of books and just started on vacation making up <laughs> the ideas for the show. Um, and we, I think, just kind of talked about it and, and gave a couple of presentations to presenters about this glimmer of an idea that we were developing slowly. And then someone that we were working with told us about this grant through the National Science Foundation that they give to artists and writers every year. So they, I think most people know in this room that there are thousands and thousands of grants given every year to scientists to conduct research all over the world. But there are six artists or writers that are chosen by NSF to go to Antarctica. And, and that program's isolated. They don't do it any place else in the world. It's just for Antarctica. And when I kind of asked why it was just this program, the answer that I got was that they feel that the dissemination of information about Antarctica is so crucial. And when when scientists are going down, that information is, is basically disseminated through journals and through education, um, which is extremely valid and, and um, important, but that artists have a different kind of reach. Um, and so one of the, the most important part of the grant is called Broader Impacts, and they really want to know how you're going to reach out to people about your show, or I mean about your, your project. So um, I, on one of those notes, I thought it was how Ross described Antarctica as being physically a place, a continent, but also uh, the temperature gu guide uh, of the rest of the planet, but we also think of it very much as a metaphor and how people identify themselves with Antarctica and how what their relationships with the continent is and how fragile and how powerful it appears, but how fragile it actually is. <clears throat> So we applied for the grant to go to Antarctica, which took us six months. And I don't know if you've ever applied for that grant or how long it took you to do it, Ross, but for, from our perspective, it was quite difficult. <laughs> what is your R-U-D-U-N-S 24 number? <laughs> Three weeks later. <laughs> um, so there was a lot of that. And, and I think what happened at that point, we were just in love with the story of Shackleton. And, and I could talk about our love for the story, but I think, you, I think everyone in this room is clear about um, the beauty of that story. Um, but we, Eric was on tour with his band while I was filling out these applications and I was dreaming every night about the continent and, and starting to fall in love with the continent as I was getting to know more and more about it. And I kind of woke up one day and thought that telling a historical puppet story isn't enough and what is that context and why does everyone need to know that story and what's important about it. And so we started to discuss that and I guess we're still trying to understand that. Um, but the title of the show, 69 Degrees South, is the place where the ship sank, was crushed and sank. And we started to ask ourselves, what is 69 Degrees South now? And how do we, um, and how do we deal with these moments of crisis? And Ross mentioned how Shackleton, um, he came the closest to the pole uh, that anyone had ever been, so he was less than 100 miles, and he knew that his men couldn't come back safely if he continued for the rest of the way, and so he turned around and he for, he forgo you know, he decided to give up on, on that goal. And if you read about polar exploration at the time, 
in almost every single story, these insane things happen where the sledge falls into the ice and all of the dogs and half of the food stores are gone and they just keep going over and over again. And you're just reading, flipping the page, like, don't do it. I know it's going to happen. And so he was very unusual in this sense. These were very unusual decisions. There was a lot of, um, a lot of money riding on these expeditions. There were, there, often they would sell press rights before they left. Um, the country and you know, the honor of the flag were at stake. There were all kinds of pressures around this. And, um, and, and Shackleton chose both times when he was in the face of, of crisis to recalibrate and take a look around and make a new choice about what their objective was. And so we, Eric and I, have been looking at how, how we do that now as a culture. And we have come together with, the, with our collaborators under the topic of climate change and, and, are, and are just asking that question, which we don't have an answer to. And if someone in the room does, I'd love to know. But <laughs> Share it with the rest of the world. How are we coming together in this moment of, of climate change? Or fill in the blank, what is the 69 degrees south for anyone here? Um, are we just? pushing forward, or are we recalibrating and kind of figuring out how we can change, um, make a change? So that <laughs> that's how we came to, to the issue of climate change. In the show, I think um, we introduced a dance element, and that's how I think we start to kind of um, tease this series of ideas out from our audience. And, um, and I think we hope to leave people rather than leave them with a kind of didactic idea about what we should be doing or climate change. We hope to have people leave with a lot of questions, actually, about who we are, who these people were in relationship to the story. And do you have something else to say about those? No, you're doing a great <laughs> job. Man. Yeah. This is Ernest Shackleton at the South Pole. Yes, we thought, because he actually never made it there himself, <laughs> I do him the favor of bringing the puppet there. So we wrapped him up and brought him all the way to the South Pole. All the way to the South Pole. You, you can see the reflection of, of me uh, holding his, Eric his... holding him up <laughs> next to him. Um, I think we have another pretty. Yeah, I was looking for the. Um... Let me, you can talk, and I'll do computer control. I was looking snow for this, angel? yeah, for the snow <laughs> angel. Yeah. yeah, so you can see that we're doing very important research. Very serious. <laughs> while we were in Documentation, Antarctica. yeah. Um, but, it, but it may be interesting, actually, to talk just a little bit about what we did while we were there. Um, <clears throat> we went, and we, I guess in our grant application, we said that we wanted to document the topography, landscape, and light. Um, and for research. And then we also wanted to make field recordings to actually embed into the soundscape of the show. So Eric, did you can talk about some of those maybe? Yeah, the, uh, I wrote the music for the play also. And uh, it's a collaboration with the Kronos Quartet, or a string quartet from, from San Francisco. And uh, we recorded basically two different libraries of sound, the natural indigenous animals and wind and uh, and also all of the and separately all of the man-made materials there and kind of distinguish between the two of them in our our piece that's eric with 150,000 penguins yeah. <laughs> that's on me, Beaufort island that's me on the right <laughs> so we we have sound recordings of um the wind howling through the stove in Shackleton's hut, for example. And then we have, um, we, we actually got to take a trip to the geographic South Pole, and, and there's Shackleton in the hut. We had to have a little bit of fun while we were there. <laughs> I mean, we had a lot of fun while we were there, but. Um, and, then we, and then we have sounds like the um, 10 meter telescope in the South Pole, the microwave telescope, and the movements that that makes. And, and we kind of paired these, these, the kind of modern dance men in the show with these modern man-made sounds in our soundscape and then the story of Shackleton. We have all these feathered kind of natural sounds that we, yeah. that we, we recorded there. There was a great, uh, we, this is the second time we've collaborated with the Kronos Quartet. And uh, the one thing we, did, we realized about our, what we both do is our instruments, for me the marionettes and for them the, their fiddles, uh, in a strange way are kind of related in that they both are wood and have strings on them. And <laughs> In, in the wrong hands, they could have been, been one another. 
Yeah, I think we told the story of how it all came together. And I guess it's important to say just our relationship with Dartmouth, which is um, has been really crucial to this project, and with Ross, who kind of held our hand through making a field plan for Antarctica. And we said, where do we, they kept asking us, the National Science Foundation, well, where do you want to go? What do you want to do? And they're kind of like, it's Antarctica. I mean, I don't, <laughs> it's really big. I don't even know where to begin. Like, Ross, tell us. <laughs> so we got a lot of advice from Ross, which really helped. Um, but when we brought the fortune teller here, someone, I think it was Margaret, someone tipped us off because they just heard the germ, really just the germ of this project starting, um, that this journal, or no, not that the journalist is, that just that the Rauner had the largest collection of, um, like a polar archival collection in the United States. And so we had to load into the theater, or we had to be in the theater every day at 10 to work on the fortune teller. So from seven to 10, we'd go to the library and we just had boxes that we were sorting through. And on the last day that we were there, we saved what we thought was just a transcription of the Orderly's diary. And Shackleton asked Orderly's to keep the log for the ship. So it's the most, everyone kept diaries, but it's the most comprehensive. So it talks about the wind direction of the day and the weather and, and at the bottom of the page, every single thing that they ate. And then his, his experience and often emotional experience of what happened on the expedition. So we were, the, the, the uh, journal's not published, so there was a transcription that we were really excited about. We opened the box and there was the transcription and we started to page through it and then there's a, another side of the box that we opened and then we saw the picture, that you, you just saw the picture of the cover of this kind of old leather encrusted cover that had the gold embossed stamp Royal Transantarctic Expedition. Um, 1914 to 1916, and we both just kind of started to weep <laughs> because we had been so deeply studying it already, and to open it up to the first page and read about when they were on, how big was that spit of ice? Flow. Uh, it was, uh, nine, the one, you know the story where they, there was a story where they were trapped on an ice flow, and they were kept awake all night by orcas swimming around, just exhaling. They could hear the spit of the killer whales all around them, and that was, you know, what we opened to on the first page with a drawing by orderlies and so needless to say we were really moved by that and then we got the um, support of Margaret Lawrence to to come and just be with the journal for two weeks with a dramaturg um, and Eric and I and then we brought up our, a video collaborator and a pair of stilts and a puppet from another show that was the same size just to do an experiment to see what does this look like and um, and we did it in front of the Hopkins Center so we just you know got a thousand yards of muslin and started sewing miles in the sewing machine and um, and Kevin from the Moore Theater helped us build a kind of armature and we built these kind of strange um, <laughs> yeah what is this Early this is not a mouse <laughs> that's, like that's not yeah that's not the complete thing but anyway I think there's um yeah there we go so, and then we and then we just played the soundtrack of Waddell Seals, which I don't know if anyone here has ever heard them, but it sounds like electronic music. It's so bizarre. And people were driving by in their SUVs on the main street, <laughs> just kind of like someone landed from outer space over there. Um, so that's that was the first thing that we did here. And then the second time we came back and we did a uh, we did our first kind of look into dance in the piece with a choreographer and um, and a visiting director, and. So this has been kind of like a research lab for us to do sketches, and it's been really supportive and really open and really low pressure and just about finding. And that's um, a pretty beautiful opportunity to be able to have. And I think anyone, whether in science or art, that gets that is, is really fortunate. Um, and here's the image from our last residency, which was in the Netherlands. And, um, and that's what we're picking up on here this week and then Friday and Saturday. I hope you'll come see the show. I just want to note that this site, um, Jessica and Eric were gracious enough to let us pour through all their photos and notes. There's videos, and um, Jones Media Center helped the hop put together this website. It's right off the Dartmouth site um, with Phantom Limb. And you're welcome to go through, and pour, I encourage you to before the show or after this panel, just to kind of take a little, little deeper look at some of that work. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you. All right, it's me again, um, and I'm going to invite Meredith to, uh, to 
jump in at any point here. Um, what I wanted to do is maybe give you a sense of what I do and why scientists go to Antarctica and to particularly this place where I've spent a lot of time, um, McMurdo Station um, on Ross Island near the edge of the continent, uh, about 77 degrees south, so much farther south than the endurance went down. Um, this is the largest uh, research station in Antarctica. About 1,000 people end up there in the summer, um, scientists of every type. Um, you know, there's maybe 800 support people and 200 scientists. That's kind of the ratio of how this kind of operation works. So it takes, just like probably a production, it takes so many different people and cooperating and collaborating, working together. And uh, I know Meredith would say the same thing. What, one of the things that draws us back is just to be around all those people and the community that's created there. So um, this is McMurdo Station. It's due south of New Zealand. You fly on a military airplane, you land on the ice, and this is sort of the home base. Um, and you can see it's pretty uninteresting. It's just uh, looks like a mining town. Um, but there is one interesting thing about it historically is this is Hut Point. And this is the discovery hut from Scott's first expedition, 1903-1905. This is Winter Quarters Bay, if you read the, the, uh, uh, the polar literature. So it, it's a site of historic importance, uh, and it's one of the longest occupied sites in Antarctica. So um, Meredith and I have both worked in the Dry Valleys, which is on the continent, about an hour helicopter flight from McMurdo. And these are these large, glacially cut <coughs> valleys. Um, they have ice-covered lakes, they have streams, they have soil, which I'm all excited about. And then there's all that glacier stuff that Meredith's <laughs> going to tell you about, right? <laughs> so, um, um, so there it is. To most people, that looks fairly bleak. To me, it's what draws me back. I've been, I've been 16 times, and I'll leave December 1 to go again. So um, still, I have polar fever, and it's not, never going to go away, I guess. So um, what, what I, my first trip was 1989. And um, uh, it was a bit probably like your writer's grant. It was like I wrote a grant for a one-time trip down with some colleagues. We had a question that grew out of research in hot deserts that could better be answered in a cold desert. This is a desert ecosystem. It's very dry. Uh, it's just very cold. And, uh, and I've, I've been in love with polar history from sort of that size. So, chance to go to Antarctica, I'd go one time and do all this stuff. Well, yeah. so, um, so we got there and we, we started trying to take the system apart. And eventually a number of small projects grew together into something called the Long-Term Ecological Research Program. And so now I work with a team of 30 scientists and they're glaciologists, they're limnologists, they're people that study soils like me, people that do climate. And we're trying to figure out how this whole system, this whole dry valley has been changing through time. When I arrived there in, in 1989, um, there was, you know, the, I, I used a ham radio patch to call home. Um, we couldn't stream iPod music from the huts back and forth like we can now. We didn't have a phone in our dorm room. Um, but it was still, it still was a, a, a great place to be and it was still much easier than the people that built the station back in the, in the 50s. Um, but when I arrived, it was a cold period. In, in the 80s and 90s, it was cold. The streams were frozen most of the time. There was about five, four to five meters of ice thickness on top of the lakes. And uh, the lake levels were fairly low, okay? Um, let's see what that, and uh, we worked either in sort of established field camps, those that are coddled like myself, you know, we kind of fly in and out and we go back to McMurdo and, you know, we go to the coffee bar and rent videos and then we go back to the field. There are some really tough people. Meredith goes into field camps, she'll describe like this for very long periods of time. And there's everything in between. Um, but this is one of the research places I've worked at for a long time, Lake Bonnie Camp. This is Lake Bonnie today. Um, and um, here's one of our snow collectors. And people come out there and they look at it and they go, why don't you put your snow collector in the middle of the lake? And I go, well, actually, that was a long way from the edge of the lake when that was installed, all right? And this is a, a helicopter landing pad here, and you can see the steps actually go into the lake. That's not how that was originally designed. In fact, we used to, the helicopters used to land at the edge of the lake on a nice flat place. Lake levels have been rising steadily. 
that got flooded. They finally built this thing. You can see it's on the slope. We moved up the slope because we thought we could get above the lake level rise. And they had to build this level area for the helicopter. And the lake's still now up to the steps. And these buildings here um, were moved last year because they were going to be inundated. So the lakes are rising. Lake levels are rising, and the ice thickness on the lakes is declining. What was three and four meters of ice is now one and a half to two, two and a half, just like we're seeing the, the sea ice in the Arctic Ocean then. So in the, in the couple of decades that I've been working there, um, whether this is tied directly to global climate change or whether this is a climate cycle restricted to this region of Antarctica, nonetheless, I've seen climate temperature and this whole ecosystem change dramatically in the window of my research there. And so the research team I'm with is trying to figure out why is all this happening? What are the implications for the organisms, the life in soils, the life in the lakes? Um, uh, how are these communities changing? How are the rates of carbon cycling changing? What are the implications of projected climate models into the future for these types of ecosystems? Um, what new organisms may be coming in with scientists into Antarctica from New Zealand and other places? As it gets warmer, can they better establish? Invasive organisms is a major problem throughout the world. We never used to think about that in Antarctica. People are now beginning to think with climate change, maybe things that couldn't live in Antarctica before, if they can get there, can now establish themselves there. So it's a whole new reinterpretation of this ecosystem that's being driven by things that we can see with our eyes but things that we can measure much more exquisitely um, with our science. So um, what draws me back is to next year, what's going to happen to that lake? Is that lake level coming up? What drives that? Um, what are the implications? And this may seem like very basic science, but if we can begin to understand how these very simple ecosystems begin to function, how they respond to climate, maybe we can take that information and apply it to the more complicated ecosystems and the more biodiverse ecosystems that are all around us here in, in our setting here in New England. So that's what gets me to the dry valleys each year, um, to understand contemporary change, change over a, a period of a 10 years intervals, very short time windows in the functioning of a place like this. Um, so I'm going to turn over to Meredith, who has a whole different time scale for understanding this place and who corrects my work all the time, so. <laughs> okay, thanks, um, thanks everybody for coming today, and um, it's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to, to try to explore the interaction between art and science, which I don't usually get to do, and I think, I'm thankful that Ross was the buffer between you guys and, 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 and me, because I don't, I don't know how to make that transition yet, I guess. Um, but it's really great to be here, and I'll try to keep it short so we can get to some question and answer time. Um, I'm a geologist. I'm an earth scientist. I'm in the earth sciences department here. I'm uh, an assistant professor, and I've been here for about two and a half years. And um, I study glaciers uh, because glaciers respond very sensitively to climate change, and we see that now. We can see that in pretty much every location on the planet where there are glaciers today that as we see global temperature, excuse me, global temperature warming, we see glaciers shrinking. And so what my work focuses on is saying, that, okay, in the past we can use, if we can figure out how big or small glaciers were in the past, we can say something about how climate has changed in the past. Um, so I work um, right now in, in Greenland mostly, um, and uh, looking at the Greenland ice sheet and um, one place that we're particularly worried about in terms of warming and melting of ice. Um, and I work in tropical regions where there are glaciers at very high altitude that are melting incredibly rapidly, such as those ones in um, Peru. Um, and I don't, I haven't worked in Antarctica in years. Um, and so it's really also interesting to be here and, and remember some of, of what I did. Um, so I want to go back a little bit in time. Um, so I'm completely thrilled and excited about glaciers now, and I can't stop talking about them when I try to teach other subjects of geology, which I'm doing, I did this morning. Um, I keep coming back to glaciers, but I wasn't always that way. And when I was a student, I was, like may maybe some of you in this room are, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And um, I graduated with a degree in geology from Tufts University in Boston, and I ended up at the University of Maine, which has a fantastic 
Um, quaternary studies programs, anybody know what the quaternary is? Bob, thank you, yeah. Oh, I was gonna ask you to answer, Bob. <laughs> Bob is our other resident uh, ICE person in the Earth Sciences Department. I'm sorry? It's the most recent epoch. It's about the last two, two million years, and it's actually, that time period is demarcated by the time when ice sheets existed on the planet, um, and in the Northern Hemisphere in particular. Um, and so I, I ended up at Maine, and I got the chance to do this fantastic master's degree project. Um, and my master's degree project was focused on Antarctica and climate change in Antarctica. And I wanna talk about this in a very different sense of from what, what Ross is talking about, because what I was looking at for this project was millions of years of time. So Ross is looking at a couple decades. And the questions that we were asking for my project we're focused on understanding the behavior of the Antarctic ice sheet itself, this huge ice sheet. So why do we care about the Antarctic ice sheet? I mean, you guys talk about how meaningful it is um, emotionally, and it's a beautiful place, and it's, it's a changing place right now, but as a scientist, I guess I would say I, I and a, as a climate, paleoclimate scientist, a climate, climate scientist, I think there are two main reasons why I care, um, or why I would say Antarctic's are very important on our climate system. Does anybody have any idea of why one of those might be? Can I draw on this board? Sea level. Me? So what about sea level? How much sea level equivalent does Antarctica contain? If all of the entire Antarctic ice sheet melted right now, how much would sea level go up? Four feet? Three. Three. 30 feet, four feet. It's actually about 60 what? meters. It's a huge amount of sea level rise. Okay, so that's one big reason we're worried about Antarctica, and there's something to understand about that. So if this is east and this is west, and I don't know if this is gonna work, but this is sort of how the Antarctic ice sheet looks. That's why I use small pieces of chalk in the Okay, so this is the east Antarctic ice sheet, and of course, okay, this isn't drawn to scale, and the topogra topographic profile isn't right, so Bob, don't kill me. I'm also an axiologist. <coughs> but what's important to understand here is if this is land, and this is land, this is west Antarctica, this has about four meters equivalent of sea level rise, and this is east Antarctica, and this has about uh, 60 actually meters of sea level rise and today what we're really worried about is West Antarctica and the reason is is because the where, where this the base of this ice sheet sits is below sea level right if this is sea level over here my weak drawing of sea level so that if sea level starts to move around because of other things going on, melting mountain glaciers or melting parts of Greenland, that could potentially destabilize West Antarctica. And Bob Cowley in the Earth Sciences Department is working on this. And this is a big question. This is really, um, you know, of concern, I think, in today's media and today's um, scientific research. East Antarctica, is, East Antarctica is a whole different beast. East Antarctica sits on land. So the only thing that's gonna make East Antarctica melt if, is if climate warms, if the atmospheric temperature warms like nuts. But East Antarctica is also a whole different beast because it's got 60 meters of sea level rise in it. That's huge, right? That's something that we probably wouldn't be able to deal with that well. So, <laughs> so this is one main reason um, why I think climate scientists are interested in Antarctica and um, Another reason I would say is just that it, it is this frozen polar thing that drives, it drives the inter-hemispheric inter gradient. It makes that pole cold, 
So it makes circulation, the atmospheric circulation go, it makes the oceanic circulation go. So it really establishes a lot of the climate systems on our planet. Okay, so changes in this are gonna, are gonna influence ocean and atmospheric circulation as well. So for my master's degree, getting back to the point, um, what, we were, what we were worried about for my master's degree was East Antarctica. And what my advisor had a project funded to look at was, okay, let's look at all the times in the past when we can say it was pretty warm or it was at least as warm as it is today, or maybe even a little bit warmer. And there was a time called the Pliocene epoch. And this was about three million years ago. And this was a time that was about three to five degrees warmer than present. And there was some evidence to show that maybe the entire East Antarctic ice sheet had melted down during this time. And so what my project was to do was to go into a place that looked like this and interpret the landscape and look at the landscape and see if there was evidence for the ice sheet, um, for an ice sheet melting down. And I do that using, look, by looking at the, the areas surrounding the glaciers. So not glaciers themselves, people like Bob and other people, um, Mary Albert, who was supposed to be here, look at ice cores and climate records and ice cores, but I actually look at the, the, the landscape around the glaciers, and I can interpret that to see, oh, was that deposited by a glacier that had a lot of water coming off of it? Or was that deposited by a glacier that was very dry? And for example, here you can see this glacier has absolutely no water coming off of it. The glaciers in Antarctica today are very, very cold. You can see their, their, their channels cut through in front of these, this, this glacier, but this is high summertime season, and there's absolutely no water coming off of it. And so this is the kind of thing I was looking for in the landscape, and I guess my relation in terms of um, art is actually, sometimes I think of my work as somewhat um, artistic because we actually do sit there on a, you know, a nice viewpoint and look at the landscape for an hour or two and, and just interpret the different features that we can see. And you can see actually what was happening in the past. Um, and so that's, that's what I was focused on um, for my work in Antarctica um, is to examine how sensitive this ice sheet is or was to past warm times to give us a sense of, okay, if we go into a future of two or three or four degrees C of warming, how stable is the ice sheet or how stable are both of these ice sheets? And my work was really focused on East Antarctica, and there's a lot of research going on right now about West Antarctica, because that's very um, much more um, at risk in today's climate. Um, I just, I guess, what else should I mention? I do want to mention one other thing, that my relation to Sh Shackleton, maybe. So Ross showed this picture, and I was, this was 1997, 1998, the winter, so this is a while ago, I was a young, person, and I lived in a field camp like that with one other person who was an undergraduate field ex um, assistant, two women, and we had three, t two tents. We had a cook tent, one of those yellow tents was our cook tent, one of them was our sleep tent. So we shared a tent together. We spent 89 days in the field, straight, uh, no, wa no running water, no electricity. We had an HF radio for communications. This was pre-satellite phone time for all of my <laughs> grad students who get to call home. And, um, uh, so we went 89 days without a shower, that's my record, um, and it was awesome, it was great, it was such a great experience, it definitely pulled me into wanting to study science, wanting to go on in this field, wanting to understand climate change and study glaciers, um, but during this time when we were out there, and, and I thought, you know, sometimes it was awful, and of course we had good food um, because it was supplied by McMurdo, but you know, it was hard. Sometimes we had bad weather, we were lonely, we were, you know, just tired of work. I was reading The Endurance <laughs> during that time. And so I would get in bed at night and just think, okay, I really don't have it that bad. <laughs> <laughs> so it was great. So um, thanks for having me here, and uh, I'm happy to try to answer any questions if you have any, particularly on the science. Thanks.
your reading Arctic Adventures and Antarctic Adventures is way better than mine. <laughs> I always thought I had such a good story about getting, taking care of the winters here. Um, I just have a few questions to sort of kick things off. The, the one, one thing that struck me um, from, from all of your presentations is, is the material. Uh, there's there's a, a dependence on materiality. Um, for, um, for, the, for Jessica and Eric, it's inspiration. There's a materiality to the wind, to the sounds you hear that you're recording, to the artifacts you saw, to the artifacts you make, right, to, in, to tell the stories. Um, for Ross and Meredith, there's the material evidence that is the ice and the, the soil and the water that you're interpreting. And I'm wondering if, if you could comment upon, and that material's all in change right now, right? It's in flux. I wonder if you could comment on your relationship with that materiality and how, how that, that may be interplays between the, the, the art and the science here. I'll open it up. Whichever one of you wants to jump in on that. It's a tough question. <laughs> We should make the artist speak first thing. Cause it's about stuff. <laughs> well, I can think of one thing uh, that comes to mind first is that because our piece is largely about the environment, uh, and in life we don't really use too many synthetics. We try to steer away from them. So in, uh, relative to how the puppets are made, at least, the puppets are made out of archival materials. They're made completely out of paper because even in making this piece, we try to be as uh, sensitive as we can. Uh, that's all I had to say about that. Initially, <laughs> 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 well, maybe. Oh, oh, go ahead. Well, I'm, I'd say let describe my research a bit more. My material is soil. I study soil in Antarctica, and there's actually a lot of people debate whether that stuff that's on the ground there is even soil. Um, and the the I think. What's fascinating about that material is that uh, when uh, Scott marched into the dry valleys in 1903, what he noted was the presence of these dried, mummified seals in the valleys that had marched into the valleys and died and were basically freeze-dried and were preserved there. And he called them the valleys of death, and he <laughs> wrote that there was no living thing. And from what's become my material, in fact, is that what we've learned since then is life is everywhere. And the soils are teeming with life, and they're, that, that the material depends upon the scale that you look at it. And if you just pick up that handful of soil, it just feels like this inert thing. Mm -hmm. And as we begin to look at it, you know, with a microscope, an electron microscope, and we begin to extract the animals out, we see that that that's this wonderful interplay of different materials and different things at different scales that make up that whole environment, right? So there's all these textures and all these layers, which I think are yeah. characterize the work that we do. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking a little bit about, you know, sort of your, your moment of, of seeing the diary, and it was there, and it's a, it's a material artifact of the time, and, and how that, that might make you imagine things differently. You, you posed your puppet wonderfully, you know, throughout those different scenes, um, and it seemed important to your creative process to interact with with what was there. Mm. Yeah, I think there's just something grounding in that. And I, we were asked when we applied for the grant from various people we were working with, well, what if you don't go? Will you still be able to make the project? And we said, well, of, of course we will. But I think um, particularly as visual artists, there's a, there's a big difference between read. I mean, I guess it's also a difference with scientists who research and do kind of academic library research and then people that go into the field. And it's, it's sort of similar with us to actually be able to experience those things and feel them and touch them and breathe them rather than just imagining what they were kind of helped us to be able to create a scenario for other people where they could imagine what they yeah. were. Because we're in, what, in our presentation, we're not presenting things in a totally realistic way. So we're, we're depending on our audiences, or not depending, but counting on our audience to bring their imagination to what we're doing, so. Meredith, do you want to comment at all about your, I, I just love your, that vision of you staring at the mountainside there, you know, the, 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 and, and trying to piece it together, because all you have to work with is what's there, right? I mean, it's the, 
Yeah, I guess um, one thing that it makes me think of is, is, is for the months before I actually went into the field, I, I worked on um, what we had were at, that po at that time bef before a lot of the satellite images on Google Earth and stuff, we had black and white air photographs that were taken by na the Navy flights. And so I looked at, um, through a stereoscope, at these black and white air photographs where you can see the topography and, and looked at this landscape over and over again and mapped things out. And you know, for months I worked on that. And then when I finally got into the field and flew into the site, and that was sort of the deposits that I w was going to spend the next three months looking at and digging in and, and, and describing and trying to date and um, understand. It was like you know, it was just this revelation of, of of actually what was there and 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 being able to to see to see that for real, I guess, rather than just imagine it in my mind from the photos for for so long. Um, why don't we open it up for questions uh, from the audience? I'm sure we have plenty here. You told us about what you did on your master's thesis, but you didn't tell us what the conclusion was. <laughs> was it was it a free of ice at one point, or was it not? Uh, based on a, a, a lot of research that has been done, in, particularly in this area in the dry valleys, um, it does not look like that area has experienced a massive collapse of the ice sheet since about 22 million years ago when the ice sheet likely formed. The ice sheet likely formed when the Drake Passage opened and it allowed that Antarctic circumpolar current that really isolates the continent from warm ocean currents. It allowed that an uh, Antarctic circumpolar current to form. And since then it looks like I would suggest the ice sheet was stable. There's a lot of scientific controversy about this. Um, one great piece of evidence is that on top of a lot of these soils in the dry valleys are volcanic ashes um, that are perfectly preserved volcanic ashes, and some of them date to 8, 9, 10 million years old. So it looks like it, through this time of the Pliocene, the warm time, things were quite stable. There's a new um, project funded by NSF, $35 million project, that's drilling offshore um, of the ice sheet to look at this question in more detail. It's known as Andril. Um, oh. Hello. Oh. Um, you talked about um, the fact that you didn't, you don't portray it in your, your play entirely realistically um, and you fall to the audience to use their imagination. Um, it reminds me when we took the tour of the, the Rahner collection, just that sensationalism and romanticism that um, people had that they, they hadn't actually been there and they were just reading these, these reports back. Um, but it was actually, you know, it, it made people more interested in the area. I was wondering how, um, how do you think your art or your process contributes to that and is that important for, for people getting excited or interested in climate change um, to have that sort of dreaminess and you know, artistic kind, kind of, of look at it? Or if you think that it's important to you know, stick to the facts? <laughs> um, that's a good question. I think that that's, I think that we want both things and that's, that's sort of where the program notes come in because we can direct people and, and the after the Q and A's afterwards, because we can direct people sort of more literally to those areas um, of exploration, which we're definitely interested in doing. In the actual show, I think, I, I mean, it's speaking for myself, and it's a very collaborative project. But I think I'd like to pe I'd like to leave people with their relationship to it more than the facts about it. Yeah, uh, based on Jay's question before relative to materialism, materialist material objects, regarding the diaries, for example, the thing based on what Jesse just said that I was thinking was that the diaries um, were the re his comprehensive recollections of what was going on for him, obviously tainted by his own experience and his own history, but it represent it offered a. Uh, uh, a a gateway into the psyche and I would say even spiritual, emotional uh, conditions that he was going through in particular and speaking collectively for the rest of the crew. So 
in a way, it is, uh, it was an invitation to experience the facts on a different plane as relative to what your question was. Thank you. I'm interested in hearing what each of you might have learned that is unique in the collaboration of institution, science, and art. That's the end of the question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I've, I've had the opportunity to work with a number of uh, science uh, and, uh, writers and artists through this program that, that uh, was described earlier. And um, I think in part, and, and when I go to Antarctica, I go with students, you know, and, and we're a team. And I think it's, it's a really important experience to slow down and look and talk and interact and begin to be around some people while you're trying to do your science who are approaching this place in just a completely different way. And, and I, I remember one day, I, I, I'm afraid I'm not remembering the name of the artist that we were with, but we were, I was walking across the dry valleys and just talking about this and that and striding along and she, we came to this little stream and she just stopped and she was just like transfixed because there were small patches of different colors of algae, you know, these al algal mats that are orange and black and a little green. And she, and, and I wasn't even looking, you know, and, and, but she, her eye had picked out that little bit of color because that's what she looks at, you know, that's, she's interpreting the landscape and color and, in light and reflection, and she saw that and just stopped. And then she started asking me questions, and I started looking at that. And then I started talking to her about, well, how do you do your colors, and what what are the media that you're working with? And um, I think there are a lot of examples like that that I could, could point out to in different ways. But um, I, I really think that it, it it just expands the way that scientists think about science when they have the chance to be around highly creative people that do different things. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think that's why NSF funds this work. It's sometimes hard to describe the interaction because it's still, I think, we don't do enough of it. Mm -hmm. but, but I think most of us find really high value in that, that type of experience. I think also similarly, we went, we collected data, we analyzed it, we processed it, and then we found a way, we looked for a way to do Share it. Right. First, we started with a crazy idea. Yes. A hypothesis. <laughs> What's that? So it's very similar to this the scientific process, and and I've just learned actually how incredibly creative scientists and scientists are. Um, and I think that it's sort of it's getting to be popular right now that artists are really coming towards scientists for more information and collaboration and seeing these overlaps. And um, so I I mean again I I could probably come up with a hundred examples of how I learned from collaborating with scientists in, in Antarctica, but in, I mean, in, in the conferences that we've done since then. But um, the best was just w was being in the dining room at McMurdo every night, um, which is, you know, like a high school cafeteria, and you walk in with your tray, and there are 20 <laughs> tables, and, and then you end up sitting down with, um, you know, just some of the world's leading scientists in cosmology and in you know Weddell seals and and just and then a military chaplain and then a couple puppeteers and you all sit down for lunch <laughs> together and the conversations are totally unpredictable and inspiring I think for everyone involved and in our experience in McMurdo is that there's there was just incredible curio curiosity and generosity all around so and um, I think the possibilities are kind of limitless and we're in our, in our next project, actually doing something related to science and technology as well. So we're, we're hooked into that relationship. Can I, can I come in on that yeah. too? Um, I guess I'm, I'm gonna say that I'm a little bit younger, so I have less experience oh. working mm. with, is, with this interaction between science and art, but I, I think it's incredibly important. Um, one example of that is you can see my drawing on the board <laughs> over there. <laughs> and, um, I think scientists are, are known for having a very hard time communicating what, what they know, even though what we know is probably really interesting and important to um, the general public. And so working with artists, I think, can, can be very helpful, or even having conversations with artists about how we convey that information and how 
we can we can make it more accessible to the public and make people actually interested in it and, and not and, and actually believe us and, and you know get is particularly being a climate scientist get by some of the the controversy over, over actually what we're what we're saying and because it is you know it's real data what we're presenting and what we're doing and for some reason we're, we're not communicating that correctly at this point so and I'd like to jump in as a as the librarian in this that that, that we have this stuff and and students come in and they look at it and and there's a wow factor to it right there's something that 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 is inspirational there but on that level alone that's not enough for me you know that to just have it thrill people I want I want more and and what can happen here is that that you can have it, it can spark something, and, it, and what can spark is an artist's reinterpretation of it, a deeper exploration of it, and a new way of communicating it, and a new wow factor comes out of that. And it can also then be contextualized and deepened um, by the science surrounding it. And so that piece, what at first was like, wow, that was actually there, you know? And I think that's people's first impression of it. Wow, it's, it, you know, it's, a, it's a real thing. And then that piece starts to take to layer on meaning. It becomes encrusted with the cultures that are being placed on it by the science and by the art. And, and it then takes on new meaning and, and can be understood in new ways. So for me, I love it when people interact with the materials in, in interesting ways because it gives it keeps those items alive, keeps them going. Yeah, Margaret. Um, uh, Ross and Meredith, you've talked about the incredible um, scale of importance that Antarctica holds and being kind of like the battery and the keeper of the w water level and lots of lots more. And um, we haven't really heard so much about scale in terms of your personal experiences being there, although we can see these incredible photos. and. And I was thinking about this because for the artists here too, when they first came to the hop, they were doing a teeny weeny piece <laughs> where everybody was sitting on the stage together and this is a huge piece physically for them and they haven't talked about how the puppeteers are actually on stilts and almost become part of the scenery. And so I wondered if anyone who likes to could say something about their own experience of scale in a Antarctica. Well, the one I often uh, recollect is thinking about being at McMurdo and looking, looking across the rice, uh, Ross ice shelf towards the interior of Antarctica and thinking it was like looking across the Hudson and going to New Jersey. But it's, I think it's 60 miles and <laughs> the little hills on the other side are eight or 9,000 feet tall. It's because there's no, there are no man-made objects, there are no trees, there are no animals except seals which look like uh, little mouse turds or and uh, you have no sense of perspective and no, nothing, no point of reference. So it's, it, as I was trying to say before, that because it's so, we think of it frequently as just being this massive, impenetrable, powerful thing. Even as you, if you take any aspect of it and get closer and closer and shrink down to it, closer and closer into it, it it's still amazing and beautiful. And uh, no matter where you look at it, what, you, it's, I'm not being very articulate because it freaks me out. <laughs> <laughs> it's just amazing. <laughs> yeah, I think that's one of the intangibles is that it is so big and it's hard to describe if you haven't been there. That's why you need, all need to go. <laughs> uh, and it, it or not. Or not. And we're working. <laughs> that's true too. Um, yeah. But when, as a scientist working there, I mean, I don't know how many, I've been down, down more than 15 times and I still cannot estimate how long it takes me to go from here or there or mm -hmm. the helicopter's coming in and I think oh I can keep working because I can get to where the landing pad from where I am in seven minutes and it takes me 25 minutes to mm -hmm. get there and you know, it, 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 it doesn't matter how long you work there that the, the vastness of it is, is, is really overwhelming to your senses I don't think you ever would calibrate to it we call it when I start working in the field we call it um, calibrating the photo because I work a lot on air photos and so it doesn't really have a you know there are no contour lines or, or, or la long lines on it so you don't have a, a, a definite scale on the map and so we think on the first on the first day where we say oh we'll go here and then we'll go here oh and this looks really interesting we'll go here and then we'll go here and then we'll go here and at the end of the day when we get home at you know 3 a.m. because it's still light out and we 
figure out how my, many miles we've walked. It's 17 miles or something. So it's yeah. calibrating the air photo. <laughs> How the puppets and the whole scenery represent uh, so many different aspects of actually being in Antarctica and that ecosystem, and um, like the music. I think that that's a really neat thing because it's, you know, you kind of think maybe it's desolate and quiet there, and that's not the case, and it's neat to bring that out. Um, so I was curious about the movement of the puppets themselves and whether you tried to incorporate a representation, like how to translate movement into the uniqueness of the Antarctic environment through the puppets. Um, well, we're s this week we're actually sort of re-experimenting with that, but um, what, we s what we started with was playing with um, how, and they're marionettes, so it's not, with a Bunraku puppet you're just, it's, it's sort of, you have to be very patient, and it's not easy to, I think, get these kinds of moves that we're looking for, which are walking against wind and trudging really deeply and, and things like that. And this week, we're looking at um, actually breaking outside of that. So it's almost like we learn the rules of how they should be in this place, and now we're um, finding a movement that evokes that but isn't that literally. Yeah. So. So, yeah, we uh, similarly when you're there, you're walking around on the ground, and it's not that unusual <laughs> in a way. You're you're uh, subject to gravity and wind and all the resistances, but there's something so profoundly surreal about it that defies a description. But it's something that marionettes can can do with a little bit. They can at least scratch the surface of how surreal the environment is. And that's what we're experimenting with a little bit right now. Questions? Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering about the rise of Shackleton. When I was a kid, uh, polar exploration was still exploration. It wasn't polar studies. And I got to see bird loading a wooden ship to go off to the Antarctic. Wow. Uh, now it's quite, quite a different adventure that's going on in the Antarctic. And part of the heroic story that everybody knew, what, what, what Shackleton was in it, but he was a minor player. Mm. But Shackleton's story has jumped to prominence lately. Do uh, you have any insight into besides the the book Endurance? That, the uh, Scotch. Uh, uh, into what, yeah. Why Shackleton is now being yeah, talked right. about everywhere? Uh, I don't know. I think there. I think there's. I think there's been kind of a cultural shift in how we view heroism, maybe, or or exploration, as you were saying, and that this idea of kind of like a, a single hero or a, a person that we, I mean, I, I think what made Shackleton's story successful was obviously they didn't accomplish what they set out to accomplish, but it was the way in which the group worked together through his leadership. And so I kind of feel like the way, when people look at Scott now, he was the person that was, I mean, he went down as a, as a martyr, and or I mean, not as a martyr, but like as a, um, I mean, he was the person that was historically kind of focused on at the time. But now, when people talk about Scott, they look at the way that he made decisions. And Shackleton. no, the, both. But they, they look at the way that he made decisions. There was just an exhibition at the Museum of Natural History um, that was kind of talking about how, how he went on that last stretch to get to the South Pole when he was against up against Admonson. And, and they all died on the way back. And I think that the quality of the decision making is something that w that we're just culturally more interested in now at least I am and I sort of hope that other people are but I just I somehow think there's been a cultural shift in the way that we the way that we look at things like that yeah and uh, relative to what Jesse was saying I think and I'm sure Jay could answer this more um, accurately but I would hazard a bet that the number of books written about Shackleton as a leader 
outnumbers the number of books that have been written about him as an explorer. His leadership skills are what we remember him for. Yeah, Shackleton's now a lot of business schools teach case studies on Shackleton. <laughs> what they do, there's yeah. books they do, on this. Yeah. They, they, they break the expedition down into areas of critical decision making and then they look at what choices or options Shackleton might have had and then they look at what choice he made and then they analyze that just as they would any other sort of business plan. And so, but I, I agree there's been a, a, a resurgence of interest in these heroic people, particularly leaders. I think mm -hmm. there's a thirst for understanding what leadership is right now. I thought you said that very well in your opening. I, I, I agree with that, that we are looking for, for leaders and, and what are the examples and uh, these are great stories and they draw us to oh, that. That's interesting because Shackleton's book called The South uh, in two volumes. Uh, volume one is all about preparing for the expedition. Yeah. And everybody else's writings are about the expedition. Mm -hmm. I think that's a central point. Yeah. yeah. That's a good insight. Yeah. There's, a, there's another quality there. I mean, uh, you know, Shackleton was unable to get funding then for future. <coughs> After he came back from this, he, he struggled mightily. He, he did another right. short thing, but, but nobody was going to fund him to, to do this again. And um, so there is sort of this, at the end of his life, a failure uh, surrounding him, I think, in the culture. But maybe, I'm part of, maybe part of it has to do, this is, this is a stretch, but it's a metaphor I've been trying to make, um, that, that hooking Shackleton with Arctic change, um, there, he turned back, right? He, he saw that death was upon him if he continued on to the pole. He gave up something he valued very greatly to, to save lives, right? To save his own and his crew's life. And he recognized that there was a moment where he could turn back and things would be okay, right? And, and with climate, and then, and then there's the heroic rescue, of course, in the, other, in the other trip. And you know, is there some metaphor there for climate change that, that there's a recognizable point where you can turn back? And, and give up something you value. I don't, I'm, that's, it's it's that, not a stretch because that's yeah. what our, that's exactly what our what piece is kind of, I mean, for us, that's where the meaning lies. Yeah. So I don't know the answer to that, but I hope that's the question that people are asking themselves. Yeah. But I know that, the, that he started getting popular in the culture before people were talking a lot about that turn back point, but, but maybe that's why he's continued. So you know, maybe, that, maybe that metaphor is starting to resonate with people in a, in a new way. Just making a, I mean, just making a choice for, um, for the collective survival of the group mm -hmm. rather than making a choice that was based on... His glory. Right. Yeah. 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 People are less interested in people like that these days, I think. Yeah. <laughs> At least I am. But. Well, maybe we should stop on that note. And uh, there's a reception outside. We'll be around to ask the panel more questions. So... Uh, Welcome to some lively conversation outside. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.